All righty, here we go. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining me this morning. Uh, we are undergoing another round of the Astro Babble. Happy Monday. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the programming, good morning, everybody on Instagram and Facebook jumping on. It's so nice to see you all. Um, but just in case you are unfamiliar with the programming, this is how it works. So I have eight charts that have been lovingly donated by you, uh, my lovely followers, and we are going to go through those eight charts and discuss themes, discuss astrology topics, um, give you all a little bit of insight. And if you or somebody you know would like to be a part of the live stream, please feel free to message me privately and I will put you on the list. I just need birth date, place, and exact birth time in order to run the chart. I do need that exact birth time. And I will be posting tomorrow asking for more names because at this point I don't have enough to continue. So I do need I do need donations um, ASAP and I'll post more about that tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, but for now, let's post a fizzy water, or pop a fizzy water, and um, go ahead and uh, get started. I'm, I'm somewhat distracted this morning, I must confess, because I've been mentioning how um, every once in a while cardinals will be coming into um, the hibiscus bush outside of my window, and I've just discovered that um, two of them are actually making a nest. They're making a nest, y'all, right in front of my window. It's so, so beautiful. Um, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Jumping on from the Philippines. Ooh, goodness. International in the house. Okay. So we're going to start with Sam. Great name. Love it. Um, Sam was born at 2.37 p.m. in Brazil. So let's take a, let's take a peek. Not Brazil, uh, but Brazil, Indiana. So that's, that's that. Let's take a peek at Sam's chart. Okay, so we've got a Capricorn moon, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Capricorn, as well as the Ascendant and Capricorn, all in the first house. That's that's tricky, tricky business. A lot of a lot of suppression um, in Sam's chart right off the bat. This is a very no nonsense chart. This is a chart that tends to be um, very much about understanding how things need to be the way that they are for a reason. There is a uh, a certain amount of fierceness and opposition in this chart that I think is really really interesting. But there's also um, there's also this this really nice lovey dovey side. Um, I think a lot of the practicality in in Sam's chart specifically is because the ruler of the chart is this Saturn and Aquarius retrograde in the second house of finance. Like the idea of of money and wealth is very very prominent in this chart. The idea of the chart being ruled by Saturn period, as well as the ascendant and the moon both being in Capricorn. We have this double Capricorn energy that's happening in the chart with Sam already right off the bat. But to have the ruler being Saturn in his home sign of Aquarius in the second house of finance and to have it retrograde a more stubborn placement. I think that this is like this is again this level of no nonsense just continues to increase you know, even with Uranus and even with Neptune, Uranus being that planet of unpredictability and Neptune being that planet of confusion and befuddlement that's in the first house of self, they're they're slapped with Capricorn, that, that sign that's going to ground them, that's going to make them hyper-focused, and it's kind of like the devil you know is better than the devil you don't, and that's, that's kind of Sam's 101 go-to, uh, is just, hey, you know, I know, I know the weaknesses, and if I, if I know the weaknesses, therefore I am, uh, a equipped to deal with them. And uh, that's definitely where the Sun and Libra and the Tenth comes in. But I think that I think that the chart can really be summarized as double Capricorn uh, with a hyper focus on money, personal wealth, uh, and finance with the ruler of the chart in the second. Uh, but when we look at when we look at Sam's chart, there are also two really interesting dynamics in the chart that I think are really, really fun. Um, the first is this water element because we have Mars and Cancer in the seventh house of relationships um, making a trine to Venus in the MC uh, and sign base to Pluto in Scorpio in the 11th of friendships. There's some really interesting intimacy uh, things and I would say intimacy issues because with, with all of these heavy water placements um, and especially with Scorpio uh, energy in the 11th on either side of the MC, with Venus and Scorpio so close to it, intimacy issues are something that we're going to need. Yeah, and the ruler of the chart is squaring that MC by degree. The MC at 11 in Scorpio is making a square to Saturn and Aquarius in the second uh, at 11 degrees. Like it's 
they're Sam, we're going to need to unpack these intimacy issues. This is this is definitely something where you know the softness, the gooeyness, the wateriness of your chart needs to be expressed, and it's often brought in by other people. But you know, if you're not if you're if you're too focused on building your own personal defenses, you know, then you're going to wonder why uh, the moat is is gradually, and you're going to get pissed at the moat gradually eating away your walls. Um, but the the moat is supposed to protect the castle, just like the walls are. There there is a level of a emotional vulnerability that is important for, you know, self-preservation, and I think that that's something that you will, you will learn over time, Padwan. Uh, however, we also have this lovely, lovely career side in the chart. We have, you know, the South Node in Gemini in the sixth being ruled by this Mercury in Libra and the Sun in Libra in the tenth house of success. I'm a huge fan of that. Um, I think that there's there's this idea of um, being very well known uh, in your chosen field, in your chosen profession, because of that sixth house being ruled by a planet in the tenth. Uh, that's always a good career marker. Although work is going to be very draining and there are toxic components to the work because that Venus in Scorpio is ruling the 10th and that South Node is present in the 6th. There is this, this give and take to the lightness that the 10th brings in your chart, Sam. And I think that there are also travel themes in the work as well, which is where some of the energy drain may happen because that Mercury is ruling not just the 6th but the 9th and Jupiter is there, Jupiter who loves to make things big. Traveling for work is actually actually going to be um, part of the equation whether you like it or not, so get used to it. Um, and I think that as you start to unpack the layers of your personal work experience, you're going to realize that this North Node in Sag on the 12th um, via Jupiter is going to be a little bit more about you as a person coming to grips with how you can help other people recover through the work that you do and kind of going on the healing journey, especially in regards to ninth house topics of spirituality, travel, foreigners, higher learning, um, and you digging into those 12th house topics to activate your 12th house, uh, ninth house topics to activate your 12th house south node. Um, despite everything being, and this is, this is what I think is really interesting about your chart, Sam, there are easy paths for you to follow and then there are correct paths for you to follow and they are different. Um, and leaning into the pain, leaning into the discomfort, leaning into the gushiness, leaning into the vulnerability is actually kind of what you're here to learn. So we can work on that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, good morning, everybody jumping on. Thank you so much. Uh, we are on to chart number two. Let's take a peek down the road. Uh, we're going to talk about Laura's chart. So Laura was born 4.30 a.m. in Maynard. Uh, let's take a peek. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay, Laura, let's let's start to unpack this because we we have some unpacking to do. And you know this. You know this. Um so we have we have an Aries ascendant. Um Yeah. Aries Ascendant with the the ruler of the chart, Mars being in Pisces in the twelfth house of karmic healing. Um with all of the activity this week uh, and last week with Mars and Pisces, um, your your 12th house of hidden enemies, hospitalizations, um, karmic healing uh, is is getting triggered on a very fierce level, Laura. So now would now would be the time to uh, really double down on your spiritual practices, really double down on your self healing work, really make sure that all of this Mars energy that is naturally kind of suppressed in your chart, because Mars doesn't like to be hidden and Mars doesn't like to be in a water sign. The idea of you know you venting some of your aggression and really letting some of your Mars out to play, I think that's that's one of the things that you need to be aware of right now because that normally gets tucked away from view because as, as somebody with the Sun in Gemini, um, especially in the third of writing, teaching, communication, like you've You've decided that you need to be versatile. You've decided that you need uh, to be very opinionated. You've decided that you need to be uh, ready for anything that comes your way and open to life's experiences. Um, but I think you've also prevented yourself from being angry. I think that you've decided that being being selfish is not 
appropriate in this life. And I disagree, especially with what's happening right now. I think it's important for you in your charts to be a little bit more selfish at this time. I think that you as a person are very welcoming and very open-minded and very broad spectrum when it comes to the stellium of Sun, Mercury, Venus, and Saturn all in Gemini in the third house of writing, teaching, communication. Like You've just got this really expanded mental space, plus the moon in an air sign at 21 making a trying to to Saturn like in Aquarius ruling that like you've got so much interesting air dynamic in the chart but this poor little Mars this poor little Mars just gets locked away and I think that you know to prevent you from going on temper tantrums to prevent you from feeling resentment uh which is a big thing like when mars is in pisces and is tucked away in the 12th no amount of your personal natural talents will be able to pull that out you need to look it straight in the face and you need to be able to say hey i i'm it's it's that scene forgive me i'm a, I'm a total disney nerd and some of you will get this and some of you won't, but I encourage you to, to watch the movie if you haven't. In Frozen 2, um, Olaf, uh, who is a snowman, um, has been living for a couple years and is starting to navigate life now that he's not just going to melt in the, in the summer. And one of the things, uh, a key scene is he says, you know, I'm, I'm sensing rising anger. And I think that that's, that's a perfect encapsulation of, of what's happening right now in your chart that needs to be vented and addressed. Because normally all of these Gemini placements just give you such a, such a charisma, such a, such a, um, such a way with words, such a teaching archetype that you've chosen to embody and you've decided that this is going to be such a profound part of your life and you're always going to be that that wise, uh, mentally astute, sharp focused person. But there's this side of you that I think needs to be needs to be expressed and needs to be vocalized that's not necessarily nice. Yeah. So let's let's go ahead and work on that. Because it's one thing to be comfortable, it's another thing to be correct. Yeah, and your correctness means getting a little bit sloppy right now, and that's okay. Uh, any and, and I say that because anybody who has moon in Aquarius is going to naturally think that detachment and apathy is, uh, is an okay thing as a long-term strategy. Um, sidebar, it's not. Yeah, surprise. Um, suppressing emotions actually intensifies emotion. Uh, so that's that's something that we need to be very, very aware of. And as you pursue success and as you use all of these natural talents in your third house of writing, teaching, communication, and you really start to understand how, how sage-like you actually are for people, I think that the big thing for you right now is to, to really dig deep and play in that 12th house of karmic healing and really work with some of the the nastier more selfish elements of your chart because it's entirely appropriate that you do so so that's that's something laura that i think is is really important um and you know one of the one of the things that you can really reflect on and i think that this is kind of this is the role of the spouse or the partner in general yeah but I think that the people who you've attracted as mates in the past have really encouraged you to do this. They've encouraged you to dig into the subconscious and dig into your feelings and actually kind of vomit up some of this vitriol uh, that they see in you that you can't necessarily see in yourself. And I think that that's, um, that's something that needs to be appreciated because they specifically have understood there is this side of you that needs to be vented. But because you're so good at all these other things, you're like, well, I just want to rest on my laurels and explore my talents and, and do my thing. Well, well, right now we, we kind of need you to do the opposite. We need you to put those talents aside and really kind of nest into some of those, uh, those muddier placements for sure. Okay. So that's that. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for jumping, jumping in. Oh, good, Laura. I'm so glad that you that you found value in that. Good morning, Craig. Good morning, Lucia. Good morning, everybody who's who's jumping on. Um, yes, very, very important. Um, Frozen Two, excellent movie. If you have not seen it, I've seen it about twelve times um, and can sing most of the songs on the soundtrack within within good range by heart. Um, okay, so let's talk about the third chart in our list. Eileen, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, uh, Eileen was born uh, 6, 6.46 p.m. in Bergen. Let's take a peek. 
uh, at this chart. Scorpio rising with Pluto in the in the first house. Girl, I see you. I love it. And we have the Sun in Cancer. Oh, we're going to be fast friends. Moon in Pisces. Ooh, triple water sign. I love it. So she's got all the she's got all those all those placements in in water signs. So when we have this is this is something to understand as well for those of you who are studying astrology or those of you who are wondering what this lingo is. So astrology is often a a science and an art that revolves around elemental signature. So we have earth, air, fire, and water, and those four elements make up a large majority of the language that we use energetically, you know, hot, cold, wet, dry, water being cold and wet, earth being cold and dry, fire being hot and dry, air being hot and wet. Um, and we use that language, those terms, to describe personality traits as well as life events and medical issues and, and things of that nature. So to have three of the major personality placements, the sun, the moon, as well as the ascendant, all in water signs gives a gives a cold, wet demeanor to Eileen, gives her a lot of that watery energy which rules things like sensitivity, the emotions, psychic skills, um, the ability to walk into a room and for better or for worse, be affected by everybody in that room on a very deep level. Um, Naturally, because of the Scorpio Ascendant, there's going to be a double dose of that kind of piercing intuition. But because we have Pisces and Cancer prominently placed in the chart, um, working with boundaries, working with um, psychic and intuitive skills, making sure that you are very, very aware of how sensitive you are, that's going to be a major, major area um, that I would love to help you work with one-on-one uh, -on -one because I, I navigate that space on a daily basis, being a triple water sign as well. Um, so just that's, that's kind of rule number one is know that basically honey you you are water um, and you need to understand that element inside outside backwards forwards in order to to navigate what life has to throw at you because this water energy is just so profound in your chart um, What's also really interesting is you have the moon and Jupiter both in Pisces Jupiter is in his home sign of Pisces in the fifth house of children um, so I think that one of the one of the big themes of your chart is fertility uh, you have an excellent an excellent um, health marker for fertility but because we also have um, a lot of a lot of uh, watery expansive planets and watery expansive signs one of the medical things i would just caution you on is lymphatic swelling um, and mastering not just the water element metaphysically but the water element physically making sure that you're you constantly have a bottle of water in your hand understanding what salt does to a watery body what carbs do to a watery body um, understanding that swelling is not just physical it's also emotional yeah because feelings follow fluid uh, somebody needed to hear that so please take that down as a note feelings follow fluid so if you are swelling on a regular basis you are emotionally swelling on a regular basis fun stuff um, let's take another peek at some of the uh, oh finances um, finance is not great finance is not great we need to be um, somewhat aware of that from a from a chart perspective, we have Saturn and Uranus both in Sagittarius, both retrograde in the second house. Saturn is the planet of restriction. Uranus is the planet of unpredictability, uh, both of them being retrograde in Sagittarius, which is a rather impulsive sign. Not necessarily a fan of that, but also because uh, Jupiter is ruling that house, I think that they're from the fifth. I think one of the major financial drains will be children. Um, and that's just something to, to be aware of. Children is expensive, y'all. Um, so that's, that's you know, word to the wise. But I think having somebody else manage your money, definitely going to be a strong suit in this chart. Um, let's see, what else do we, what else do we want to talk about? We have this really interesting dynamic. I'm not sure, where's Mars? Mars is in Capricorn in the third. Um, there's this really big kind of principle energy that I'm feeling um, because we have the North Node in Aries in the sixth, which is a little bit of a power hungry placement. Um, and then Mars in the third of writing, teaching, communication, plus Neptune in, in, in Capricorn, both of them retrograde in the third. You, you'd be very good as a principal. Like you, you have that, you have that fierceness, you have that, that, that ability to sway, you have that ability to um, manipulate other people very well, especially with those water placements. Let's, let's be real, water placements are the king at manipulation. 
Um, but I think that that's something that might be really interesting for you to explore is authority in the scholastic space. And part of that is because I'm seeing it, I'm seeing this 9th, 10th, 11th house um, back and forth because Mercury is in Leo ruling the 11th in Virgo where your uh, MC is and then the Sun is in Cancer ruling the 10th from the 9th of higher education. So I think that I think that you working in a higher profile position in a scholastic environment, especially one where you get to experiment with this idea of teaching from a powerful place uh, via that 6th house north node, I think that that's a key to unlocking the chart in addition to you know working with your own children which is going to be activating this really really deep sensitivity and a different level. It's it, there are two different sides of your chart. Like you working with your own kids activates all these water placements. You working with um, your scholastic placements and your ability to su succeed in the workplace. Those are all fire and earthy placements. Like that's that's a very different kind of volcanic energy as opposed to you know a, a deep ocean energy. So those are really the two big the two big parts of your chart, um, and the two often conflict from from that perspective. But you know, you'll get over that over time as the chart matures. Excellent. Cool. Yeah, that's all I have to say about that chart. Very nice. Well done. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that I'm so glad that what I'm saying is resonating from all the comments. I appreciate you all very, very much. Thank you for donating your charts. Um, let's talk about Bettina. So Bettina was born at 9.41 p.m. in uh, Tonsberg. Tonsberg, I, I believe that's how you say it. Um, forgive me for the mispronunciations. Um, so let's talk about uh, Bettina's chart. So Bettina has Cancer on the uh, in the first house on the ascendant. So we have this watery energy to the chart. Okay, so we talked about this in in previous live streams before, but I just wanted to reiterate. So a lot of people are familiar with their sun sign, some people are familiar with their moon sign, and then some people are familiar with their rising sign as well. These are three parts of the chart that are really, really important. They all give us personality traits, right? But when we have three different signs that are very, very different, as opposed to the previous chart where we had three water signs, yeah, um, it, can, it can lead to a little bit of conflict of personality, and this is something that I work with clients a lot with, is under, understanding the different pieces of themselves, right? So we have the Ascendant in Cancer, which is Bettina's Ascendant, and it gives us this personality trait of this motherly, nourishing energy uh, that comes forward that's very emotional and sensitive, but fiercely protective. However, the moon that is ruling the chart is in Sagittarius conjunct frickin' Uranus in the in the sixth house of work. So we have this fiery, workaholic, spontaneous, eruptive energy in the sixth house of, of work that's very contradicting um, to this watery energy of the ascendant. And I think that these are two pieces of Bettina's equation that can be a little bit hard to, to navigate because one is very explosive, very charismatic, very fun-loving, very joyous, uh, very very fiery versus the ascendant is very cool and calm and watery um, and that that can lead to a little bit of back and forth that that can can leave Bettina with with a big old question mark and to wrap it all up we have the Sun in Libra in the fourth as well as co-present with a lovely Venus in Libra in the fourth as well so as as she's trying to balance this really sensitive heart space and this not so sensitive very bombastic would be a good word a uh, sixth house of work. I think that there's also this fourth house of family and home that really just brings this um, this this peace, this balance um, that feels like a third part of the life that that needs to be brought in and understood. But by by all means, the fourth house of family is the refuge. It is the safety zone. It is the sacred space. Because no matter what happens in Bettina's life, she can always come back to this lovely, lovely Venus ruled sun and Venus and Libra in the fourth house of home to to find solace, to find peace, to find balance, to find comfort, to find beauty while she's out, you know, after she's out and about kind of doing all of the, the career things that her her little overactive workaholic heart desires. 
And I do say that with love, because I also have the ruler of my chart in the sixth, and I know what that's like. You've just decided to put Uranus, the planet of unpredictability, on top of your moon in that house, which means that, you know, you're kind of addicted to, you're kind of addicted to the drama of it all. Not gonna, not gonna lie. Um, and I think that that, that serves you well, because you know how to use that to your advantage. You know how to shake things up. Like, that is, that is also your job, is to go in and expose things by just basically throwing dynamite around. Um, and I think that that's an important trait to respect and honor. Um, but at the same time, as you as you channel this somewhat overly creative energy of Sagittarius in your chart, um, there are there are limits that need to be imposed on you and others uh, because Sagittarius often does not know when to quit. Um, you've also put some some pretty heavy placements in the fifth house of children. Um, which I'm not necessarily a fan of, I have to be honest. Um, we have Pluto here, we have the South Node here, we have Mercury here within one degree of that South Node, and then we have Saturn and Scorpio in the fifth. Um, this, this brings up a lot of uh, questioning for me in terms of reproductive health. Uh, this brings up a lot of questioning for me in terms of potentially the early loss of a child because of the South Node and Saturn here. Um, it, it will become easier later in life, especially after 30 and after 50, as the planets mature in this space. But this is this is a, a rather unkind placement um, to the fifth house of creativity, children, and parenting. So we just need to be aware that there may be some sinister energies in that house that need to be balanced. Um, and I think that that's something that we can we can work on one on one. But. Um, Let's see. There, there is this, there is this aspect of teaching in the chart that I find kind of interesting, especially teaching, teaching children, um, and or caring for neighbors' children. The idea of you kind of always being put in that position where you're, you're opening a book for story time is a good way to think about it. Uh, with that, that Mars in, in Virgo constantly kind of. Uh, plowing the next generation and and getting their getting their little minds kind of ripe for for the implantation of new knowledge uh, with that that green god archetype of the the Mars and Virgo in the third of writing um, especially with that ruling the tenth house of success I think that there will be some sort of teaching writing communication elements to your um, to your success down the road as you activate that skill and understand that with enough focus these fire signs can actually be very productive we just need to get that productivity down on paper darling okay good stuff Fabulous. Um, oh well, let's let's talk about the North Node as well. Um, I think, Bettina, one of the things that you need to understand is, you know, your your life's mission this time around is actually to develop a really strong social network and a tribe. Um, because of this North Node and Taurus being ruled by Venus, the the most positive planet in your chart by far. Uh, the idea of you specifically hosting groups in your home, um, and or uh, just developing, just developing this family, both close and far. That's that's constantly um, fueling your spirit. That's really enhancing your self-esteem. You having all of these connections, both locally and abroad, will really help to root you down, activate some of these more positive placements, and give you kind of a network to lean on in times of in times of strife or uncertainty, especially as you as you use these more combustive placements to uproot, you know, your your relationships this go around are going to be the rooting force of your life. Um, although some of them might be a little bit more testy, especially intimate relationships with the Venus square, uh, Neptune in, in Capricorn in the seventh. I think that there is this idea of friendship specifically and social groups and tribes being a very grounding force that you're here to learn how to make friends um, as opposed to as opposed to making enemies. Excellent. Cool. So that is our fourth chart in the lineup. Um, and now is the time that I get to take just a quick little break to, to ask you again for charts. If you or somebody you know would like to be a part of the live stream, just private message me or have them private message me their birth date, place, and exact birth time. Um, make sure that they follow me or add me because oftentimes if they don't follow me already, the message goes into message requests or I, I can't see it as well or I don't get those notifications. Um, and likewise, if you would like
like to book a private consult, you can always go to ScorpioRisingAstrology.com, my website. I also just launched uh, my weekly forecast on YouTube, so I've been posting these videos on our YouTube channel. Um, but if you search in YouTube for ScorpioRisingAstrology.com, my website, uh, the channel will pop up and you'll be able to see my weekly forecast as well as my dailies on socials. And um, yeah, come book, a, come book a session with me, purchase an online class through my website, and, uh, and we'll get you hooked on the astrology, astrology bandwagon, and uh, yes, so that would be that. Okay, moving on to chart number five, we have uh, Lily. Lily was born 7.48 p.m. in Leominster. Let's take a peek at Lily's chart. Okay. So we have another Scorpio rising. This time we have South Node in the first house, which is a little bit difficult for personality. Um, the South Node is that energy suck of the chart. Wherever the South Node is placed, it's, it tends to be an area where we feel drained. And to have the, the first house of self containing the South Node, there's this idea that the personality itself, the body itself, is drained. So specifically, this might look like, from a, from a medical astrology standpoint, Scorpio ruling bladder, uh, colon, sinus, as well as reproductive area having the south node here might put a, a strain on those body systems or may underdevelop those body systems. However, putting the north node in Taurus in the seventh um, is an interesting choice. It means that relationships are going to be, oh, honey, but you've, you've, you've done things in your chart that I'm not, I'm not super a fan of. Okay. Okay, Lily, so here's, here's the deal. Um, you've decided that relationships are going to be a very important part of why you're here. You've decided that relationships and finding a partner that you can spend your life with um, or multiple partners that you can spend your life with, uh, that that's going to be the, the goal, this, this go around. Um, however, you've also linked this Venus and Aries in the sixth to your seventh house of relationships. And I think that one of the things that you subconsciously do um, and something that you're also um, semi-attracted to, but we need to understand that it's, that's, it's a negative pattern, um, is you're prone to asking your suitors to fight for you um, and to prove their worth via competition and to prove their worth via self-improvement, development. Um, Venus doesn't like to be an Aries. She feels, you know, Venus is the goddess of abundant and unconditional love, and putting her in the action-oriented sign of Aries makes her love conditional to progress. So here's here's the conversation. Oh, you want to you want to be my my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my significant other? Well, prove it to me. Um, and that's that's not necessarily how love works, but it is how you've defined your sense of love. Um, and I think that, you know, it's it's very much this this idea, like another Disney movie that's coming into my head is uh, Aladdin, the, the original, not the remake, because this scene was cut out and I don't like that. Um, but the idea of Jasmine, uh, all, the, all of the men are arguing over, you know, whether Aladdin Ali is fit for Jasmine, and Jasmine just storms out and she says, I'm not a prize to be won, and I think that that was one of the most important lines of the movie. Um, however, it's the flip for you, Lily. Um, you you feel like you are a prize to be won. And I agree, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that you need to understand that, or at least the people who you've decided to bring into your life need to understand that unless they are constantly improving their game, unless they are on top of themselves and really working to grow and to better themselves, then they're going to lose the race and they're also going to lose you because there is a certain expectation of earning your love through achievement that is that is a big part of your chart. Um, and that, that goes for family, too, because we have, um, we have that Mars and Aquarius ruling Venus from the fourth. I think that the idea of you specifically applying those same rules to family, um, prove it to me, is, is kind of one of the, the things that, that your chart is really, uh, is really saying over and over and over. And I mean, it's not like it's not like you don't deserve it. I just think that there's, it's it's almost a contradiction because you have all of this softness 
in your chart uh, with your your moon in Pisces, your ascendant in Aquarius, your sun in Taurus in the seventh. Like you're so you're so in love with the idea of love, and then to put this standard on top of it, I think it's you know partially a protective mechanism, but it's also it's also something that I don't quite understand. Something that we might need to talk through. Um, Da, da, da. What are you doing with the... Oh, well, hmm. yeah. So, Sun in Taurus is also uh, ruling Jupiter in, in Leo in the 10th. So, again, being attracted to somebody who is who is famous, well-known, well-versed, kingly uh, or queenly, somebody who's very much about uh, the, the royal status of this Jupiter in Leo uh, connected to the seventh house of relationships. I think you're just, you know, you're... You're destined to marry the 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 royalty of your of your dreams, honey boo boo. It's just um, it's just you've decided to put a lot of pressure on yourself to do it, and pressure on them for sure. There are, there are conditions um, that I think are are really interesting. Um, you specifically making money more towards the half halfway point of your life around fifty because of the fame that you earn. I think if you this is a bad example, and I'm going to say it's a bad example, but hear me out, because this is where we go in astrology. Pluto is a planet that tends to mature around 50. You've placed that planet in your financial house connected to your 10th house of success. Because of this, it would be it would be a thing in traditional astrology for you to marry somebody famous for some reason, they pass away, or the fame that you've inherited through that relationship comes to a fruition and you're able to earn income from that relationship potentially ending um, because of Pluto being a planet that represents death, but the idea that you are also connected to that power post the relationship ending. So elevating your social status via marriage, which then leads to money. That's, that's a big part of your chart dynamic. But we have to remember how sensitive and creative you are in your own right. And I think that, you know, despite despite your long pursuit to have somebody in your life who com who completes you, FYI, you are whole and do not need to be completed. Um, that's just a thing. But the idea of this Pisces moon and this Uranus and Pisces in the fifth, I think that there's a there's a natural creativity that you have that needs to be exercised on a regular basis and I would really like you to be known for not just these relationships that you develop but your creativity in your own right because you do have such a such a sense for for art and fashion and creativity in general excellent okay on to on to our next chart uh, so let's go to Kali. So Kali was born uh, 2.47 p.m. in uh, Worcester. We have Virgo Ascendant. Oh, that's fun. Oh, Kali, I'm a fan of your chart. Yes, we have a Virgo Ascendant ruled by Mercury and Taurus, who is about to station. Venus and Taurus is ruling that Mercury, as well as the Sun at 29 degrees, can join the North Node uh, in Taurus at 29 degrees. That's that's a pretty powerful that's a pretty powerful indicator that the ninth house is where you're going to be at for a large majority of your life, Kali. Um, you are absolutely fascinated absolutely fascinated by ninth house topics of spirituality, foreign culture, travel, higher learning. Um, it's it's just such a big part of who you are. That ascendant at 28 degrees is also making a trine to the sun in Taurus. I mean, it's, it's such a big part of you. I would highly, highly encourage you to pursue those topics career-wise as well. Um, however, the idea of you um, just flourishing in that house is, is a part of the chart that cannot be ignored because you have so many powerful placements here. It's just absolutely ridiculous how good you are at those topics and how naturally they come to you. You and how powerful you will be if you learn how to channel those those experiences and those natural inclinations. You also have multiple success markers because of that. That Mercury is ruling your Saturn MC conjunction in the 10th house of success. Foreign language, definitely something I would investigate if you're not already learning multiple languages. I would highly encourage it because you're going to not only need it, but you will be very, very good at it. 
um, especially languages that are beautiful, uh, like like French and um, French and, and Spanish, um, things that just are very very um, hot when when spoken uh, because of that Venus influence. Let's see what else. Um, I know it's I know it's tempting. I know it's tempting for you to default into the role of the teacher. However, that's not um, you're not supposed to be doing that unless it's at a college level or beyond. Um, if you're if you're trying to play it small and be this this local teacher who's you know teaching as an example, teaching Spanish in the third grade, like that's not tapping into your potential, darling. Um, instead, that's kind of contradicting to to who you are as a person. We really need you to be investigating this more worldly, cultured um, side of you in the ninth house where you're studying um, abroad, where you're studying um, different, different cultures and how they operate, learning their languages, their customs, um, and and to a certain degree, you know, writing about that and and teaching about that, but not in a traditional classroom sense, because uh, that's when your chart sort of falls apart a little bit. Um, and you'll know you'll know specifically what I mean because this this moon in Aquarius in the sixth um, is somewhat apathetic at its worst. So the idea of when your heart turns off. Kali, um, I think that that's that's your indication that you're no longer in the place that you should be, and that's that's kind of the that's the that's the red flag, for sure. Um, this Uranus and Pisces in the seventh, oh, being ruled by Jupiter and Leo in the twelfth. Um, from a relationship standpoint, I think you need to be aware that somebody who is naturally going to be very vagabond and spiritual is naturally attractive to you, but that doesn't mean that they're correct or safe. Um, because you have this worldly energy about you, and it's it's definitely where you're going, I think that there's a there's a sense of being attracted to to people who are a little bit more spontaneous, who have a little bit more of this Uranus and Pisces energy in your seventh house, who tend to be very unpredictable, flighty, uh, vagabond would be a good way to say it. They're they're just kind of they're that fool card in the tarot, uh, just going along a path and they don't know where they're going. Um, they're just letting spirit guide them, um, and that's that's fine, except for the fact that it's not necessarily a stable relationship that's going to lead to long-term um, long happiness. Instead, it might activate your 12th house of hidden enemies, karmic healing, so that journey, that trip, might actually be um, might actually be a little bit more harmful or toxic in the long run. So I would highly encourage you to be a little bit more skeptical of the people that you're attracted to. Um, just because they have this energy that makes them seem friendly does not mean that they are, that they have your best intentions at heart because they tend to, they tend to play fast and loose is a good way to say it with that, um, with that Uranus and Pisces. And that's not something that um, we need to do mucking up all these placements in Taurus, which are so grounded and, and flourishing and lovely. We, we need a little bit more stability in the relationship department. Okay, cool. Excellent. So that is uh, Kali's chart. Lovely. Um, let's take a peek. We have two more charts, and then we will be done. Ryan. Ryan. Ryan, why? 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 Why are you doing this to me, Ryan? Crazy, this chart. Absolutely crazy. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. So Ryan, Ryan was born 9.54 a.m., um, also in Worcester. Let's take a peek. Uh, we have the Ascendant in Capricorn, as well as Moon, Pluto, and Mars in Capricorn uh, in the first house. This, this gives Ryan a double Capricorn vibe. Um, making him very stern, making him uh, very hard, making him an impenetrable fortress for a couple reasons. The first of which is a double double Capricorn, so moon and ascendant in Capricorn. Yeah? Um, so we have double of that cardinal earth energy that's always striving towards um, always striving towards the pinnacle of success, always trying to do their best, 
always trying to create um, create a life, not just um, not just kind of live paycheck to paycheck. But we also have this Mars in Capricorn in mutual reception with Saturn in uh, Saturn in Scorpio up in the eleventh, and we have Mercury in Scorpio retrograde in Kazemi with the Sun in Scorpio in the eleventh. Um, so back to this idea of you being an impenetrable fortress, Ryan. I think that it's it's important to understand that you, of all people, deal in the currency of secrets. Um, you, as an individual, have a have a natural sense of charisma um, because of these Scorpio placements. People are very interested in you for reasons that they can't necessarily explain. Yeah. However, you do pique people's interest in a very visceral way, um, and that power comes with a certain amount of responsibility, which will likely be abused in the teenage years, and that's okay, because we all have to learn how to elevate our placements over time, and you don't do that without getting muddy, especially with the MC in Scorpio making an exact trine to Neptune and Pisces in the third of writing, teaching, communication. You are extremely good um, at weaving the spoken word uh, to impress people. However, it is often going to to be false or untrue until you learn how to be more authentic. Part of the part of the drawback to you being so secretive and such a such a fortress of a person um, is that you you don't understand how to tap into the truth as well as you think you do because when you shut people out, you don't just shut people out; you also shut yourself out from people and limit yourself to be exposed to the actual truth that's going on. So your lies become your truths and vice versa, which get, which is very confusing in the first part of life until that Saturn matures because it rules the chart. Um, I would highly encourage you to um, keep this in mind. Save, save this recording, keep this in mind because it's going to become important in your mid to late 20s as this Saturn return comes to fruition. Um, no matter how many people you hurt, and no matter how many people hurt you, they didn't mean it, and you didn't mean it. You were just trying to figure out who you were, and that's okay, and you are forgiven. Um, you are specifically forgiven because of the Saturn return. As you start to gr come to grips around 30 and Saturn moves back into Scorpio, you're going to start to understand that there are, there are, you're going to start to understand how to use the tools that you were given. And that becomes a, that becomes a really powerful turning point, especially with these, these really intense placements, um, because you've decided to be so skillful. But what happens with, when you play with knives is you get cut and you cut other people. And sometimes you do it intentionally and sometimes you do it unintentionally. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, you, you stretching and trying to flex your wings and trying to be the best person who you are when the tools that you have been given are specifically sharp and dangerous. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay for you to be a little bit rougher around the edges than most people. Um, however, as you start to learn to harness these Scorpio and Capricorn placements, there's going to be this amazing, absolutely amazing ability to to rally the people. Um, you having this mutual reception and such a close, such a close synastry between the first house of self and personality and the eleventh house of friendships and social groups. It's such a, it's such a blessing. Um, and it's such an opportunity for you to use your power for good um, and for you to really be somebody who takes charge, who becomes a leader, who becomes somebody who is at the head of their community, somebody who is able to often negotiate very tricky communication situations, somebody who is able to understand what it's like when other people do not and to advocate for those processes because of, because of all of your Scorpio and Capricorn placements. It's just and it's an absolutely beautiful way for you to navigate the world. Unfortunately, that power will be misused and misunderstood, and that's just natural for the first part of the life. So I would encourage you, it's like we need to stick you in a gun range. Like we need to get you to 
understand the idea of power. We need to get you to understand the idea of what it means to take a life. We need to get you to understand the idea of using these Scorpio and Capricorn placements that will be harnessed for leadership appropriately. You know, electricity can cook a dinner, but it can also cook a person. Yeah, you're dealing in electricity. You're dealing with secrets. You're dealing with power, raw power, the kind of power that very few people will understand. And that's something that unfortunately will be hard because what do you do when you give power to a child child doesn't know how to use it and will often hurt people because of that but as you mature and as you start to unlock these placements and start to understand how to use social groups and your ability to sway the masses to your to your beck and call for good to enhance community, to enhance um, not just your life, but the lives of others. I think that there's a massive, a massive ability for you to become this Pied Piper um, archetype that um, is both intentionally feared and respected. So yeah, that's that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for donating your chart to science. Um, we have one more chart, and then we are done for the day. Let's talk about Alexander. Alexander was born 9.03 a.m. in Boston. Uh, let's take a peek at Alexander's chart. So Alexander um, was born with uh, the Ascendant in Virgo. Chart ruler is this Mercury in Cancer co-present with the Sun in Cancer. Really just makes him... Um, really makes him this this soft and squishy teddy bear uh, with an analytical edge although this moon in, this moon in Capricorn would like to be would like to be so hard so tough so so gruff and and business oriented and focused and all of these things that that Alexander would like to be and he wants to be the tough guy and unfortunately honey boo boo darling you just you're too squishy um, and I say that with, with love and affection, because ultimately, all you want to do is exercise your cancer placements of mothering, of protecting, of nurturing, of caring for, and applying your bleeding heart to the wounds of others to heal them. Like, that is, that is so much, so much of that cardinal cancer energy is in your chart and I think that that's that's a beautiful thing and you shouldn't be ashamed of that and especially in earlier years I'm sure that that was that was a point of contention of you trying to trying to exercise this Capricorn moon this Virgo ascendant and say you know I really just care about the details and let's get down to business and you know I really just think that if we if we took the emotions out of the equation we'd perform a lot better and you tried to try to rationalize and and make these these watery soft aspects of you earthen and hard and rigid and eventually the more the more you kept trying to be difficult yeah the more you actually ended up realizing that you you can't hold that persona um for very long and i think that that's uh i think that that's a beautiful realization but it is something that uh you you'll have to come to terms with eventually um yeah Oh, that's interesting. Huh. We've got some interesting financial stuff happening. Um, Jupiter, Jupiter, Saturn uh, almost conjoined in Libra, as well as Pluto and Libra uh, ruling the... Uh, being ruled by Venus and Leo in the 12th, as well as 6th house, uh, house Aquarius ruling that Saturn, Saturn in Libra is, is really taking a really interesting turn in the chart. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if you worked in the medical field. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if you worked in hospitals, jails, um, retreats, uh, but you're dealing with that 12th house placement and that 6th house of work, the idea of what you do for a living, specifically surrounding the concepts of health and wellness, um, but also those places where we tend to put people away in order to work on their healing process, whether that's, you know, a, a forced situation like a rehab or a jail, um, or if that's, if that were an asylum, or if that's something where, you know, you're, you're literally, because of those cancer placements, just really good at taking care of people and you've decided to make that your profession. 
I think that it's important for you to understand that that 12th house concept because you do have the North Node in Leo here ruled by the Sun in the 11th. Like, you're here to build teams of caregivers, um, and that's a very important distinction as opposed to you just being um, a single caregiver trying to do a job. Like, you're here to rally the troops and to really make sure that, you know, we have enough battlefield medics to go on the journey as opposed to just kind of you you going through the, the journey alone and trying to do the best that you can. You're actually here to activate these 11th house placements and work with the tribal aspect of the community as opposed to, you know, you you doing it solo. This isn't a solo mission this time around, uh, Alexander. Um, let's see. Yeah, entrepreneurialship is a big a big part of the chart as well. Um, you being known for your entrepreneurial spirit, you working on your own business because that south node in the sixth. Um, you'd be a great consultant in the healthcare field as well. You'd be the person that comes in to uh, to work on finance specifically, to work on organizations, to work on reordering teams uh, and working on team building and team dynamics. Like you, you're very very good at those detail oriented but family oriented, group oriented um, type activities. Uh, also, there there are things you know, teaching, writing, speaking. Although it's not it's not a strong suit for you, it is something that uh, tends to be like the reason why the reason why teaching, writing, speaking is a little bit difficult for you. Um, but it is something that you will be known for. You know, it's it's difficult because the only things that you can think to to talk about are the hard truths of reality. Um, and to scare people almost in acting the right way, and there is a there is a certain there is a certain amount of power in that, and there's a certain amount of validity in that. But we also need to understand this Uranus and Scorpio retrograde in the third house of of communication does mean that you know you can be a little bit shocking, you can be a little bit gruff, you can be a little bit whoa uh, at times when you address when you address these crowds. So maybe soften just a little bit your approach, script things out, and make sure that you're not being uh, uh, too too uh, enticing would be a good a good way to uh, inciting of of that Uranus energy. But I think that you know financially there is this really strong financial component in the chart with Jupiter, Jupiter and Saturn as well as Pluto here. Money is going to be a big part of the life, whether you like it to be or not. Whether you're working on budgets for other people, whether you're working on budgets for yourself, uh, money is something that will be mastered gradually. But it will get that time time focused boost because of Saturn and Pluto here. Saturn is also in the sign of his exaltation. I think that that's really really strong um, for you to be a master of money um, and. Re resources and time and energy like you just you have all of these really great placements of how to how to work with large groups of people um, to help them get down to business but also still have this sun and cancer mercury and cancer where like your heart's in the right place and you really just want to make sure everybody is comfortable and safe and taken care of and that really works well in the healthcare dynamic that you've chosen to integrate into your into your chart Perfect. Okie dokie. That is it, everybody. We are done with our live stream for this morning. Thank you all for jumping on and continuing to watch. Um, I'm very much uh, grateful that we can do this. I will be posting tomorrow asking for more chart information if you know people who are into astrology and would like to participate in the live stream. It is free. You can just have them message me their birth date, place and exact birth time. I will add them to the list and we will feature their chart and I will message them when their chart is featured. Um, if you would like to book a private session, you can always do so by going to ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. That's my website where my consultation stuff is. Uh, links to the YouTube channel. I just posted the week forecast on YouTube. Um, I'll post this video on here as well. Um, check out Instagram, check out Facebook, check out TikTok, um, check out all the major platforms that uh, you would like more astral info on. And uh, we'll keep doing this and we'll keep talking about the stars and having a good, good fun astro babble. Um, but that is all for today. Thank you for watching. And as always, may the stars be ever in your favor. We'll see you soon. Talk to you later and have a fantastic